sweet present Your promise remain You are the last word Your love takes away All sin and shame Looking back on blessings You've been faithful Working all things out Anxious for nothing Prayers are steadfast Face a new freedom without any fear. Oh, Lord, lead us into every new season, every new year. Hallelujah. 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 
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone, online. God is great. It's a, spring has sprung. It's a beautiful day. The rest of the East Coast is on shaky ground, but we're not. So, um, it's funny. I think I'm the only person that didn't feel anything. Okay, good, good. I'm getting texts from my friends in Pennsylvania and New York, New York, North Jersey. Like, did you feel that? No? So... Uh, got some announcements this morning, a lot of praises, um, and, uh, you know, like I said, God is great, um, uh, Bill Powell was in the, uh, rush to the emergency room with a heart attack, but he's made a turn for the positive, he's, this morning, he's feeling good, he, he's, uh, uh, texting with Cheryl, and, um, so that's, that's answered prayer, um, I'm going to read something from Pam and uh, uh, Steve DeBrill. I would like to thank everyone for the prayers and cards during these last few weeks. Since Stephen's surgery, we found out that the doctor, uh, from the doctor that it was not cancer. That was an amazing answer to all of our prayers. Please continue to keep Stephen in your prayers as he's still trying Still not able to do anything for a total of six weeks, but that's um, the the praises come in. Um, uh, Charlotte, Charlotte Mitchell had some positive reports. Um, they just God is good. I can't say it enough. God is good all the time. So uh, for announcements this week, um, we've got the prayer meeting Tuesday night. It's April 9th at 7 p.m. It's every week. Over in the chapel, uh, ladies' Bible study is on this week for April, uh, Wednesday, April 10th at 10 a.m. at Betty Harris's home. Um, youth night, again, it's every other week. This week we have it on Wednesday. It's always Wednesday, April 10th at 6 p.m. If you know um, some youth that like to come out and have a great time, learn a little bit about the, 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 about the scriptures. Uh, and again, it's, it's a fun night. Um, we always have something to eat. Um, Invite them. Invite them or bring them. Uh, leadership team, we have a meeting this Thursday uh, at 6.30 p.m. Now, there is no pickleball this Friday, but don't worry. It'll come back. It'll come back next Friday. Um, the reason we're not holding pickleball is we're going to be setting up for the uh, Penny Party Benefiting Ranch Hope this Friday. So it's going to be here at the Fellowship Hall on Friday, April 12th at 6 p.m. And uh, tickets are $20 a piece. But it's a, it's a great, great cause. Uh, those kids... They need every break they can get. Um, and just, again, keep everyone in, in, your, in, your, in prayers. There are still people not doing well. Keep Atlantic City Rescue Mission in your prayers and, and the uh, search for the starting of search for a new pastor. That's it. Thanks. Good morning, church. Please stand. We're going <clears> to <throat> sing. We're going to sing about how great our God is. We just celebrated that he is risen, and now we're going to celebrate that our God is greater than any other God. Water, you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. Out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer.
Free to do the motions on this song if you know it. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome. I'm glad everybody may be here this morning. Um, 
We have our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 24, verse 46. Matthew 24, 46, if you have your Bible. It's talking about the, the coming of the Lord, and it's um, on a day that's, that's unknown to us. And um, kind of in verse 46 here, we have an answer to a question that was posed by Jesus. Is what, what, should the, what should the servants be doing? And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 46, it says, It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Let's, um, let's go to the Lord in, repair, in, in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here some, uh, this morning. And it's, just, it's so great to come here and start our week in, in prayer and in worship of you, Lord. And there is no God like Jehovah. We thank you, Lord, for those, those songs this morning. We thank you for the reminders that they, they share with us, Lord. Um, there's just no one like you, Lord. And, and we acknowledge that. We lift up your name this morning. We, we remember the accounts of who you are in your word, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that we would spend more time in your word remembering who you are. Um, you, you are the God of the Israelites who took your people through, through the Red Sea on dry ground, Lord. Um, you stopped the Jordan River from flowing downhill during its high season, and you brought Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah out of the fire, and they didn't smell like smoke, Lord. And there, there's just nothing that's beyond your abilities, Lord. And it's, it's with that thought and acknowledging who you are, Lord, that we bring you the honor and glory in everything that we do. And we lift this church up to you. We lift our, our search for a new pastor up to you, Lord. We, we know, Lord, that you have a, you have a man for us, Lord, and, and you are working on his heart and you are preparing him just like you prepared King David for, for the throne of, of, of your people. Uh, we know, Lord, that you are preparing a man for this church, and um, we pray for him now. We pray for his family even now. We pray for our hearts. Um, we pray for our hearts that we would remember to pray for this man on a regular basis, that we would pray for him and support him once he is here. And I pray, Lord, that we would rally around you that we would rely and lean on the promises of your word, that, that you will supply and you will provide and you will take care of us, Lord. And we, we lift you up and we thank you for that, Lord. Uh, we lift up our praises, Lord. We, we lift up Steve that he is cancer-free. Um, just, you just bless us in so many ways, Lord. Um, we still have a few that are, that are in the hospital or not doing well. Ralph is home and we thank you that Ralph is home, but he still has a long way of recovery. He's in a lot of pain, and we pray for Ralph, and he's such a great, just a, a, a great servant, Lord. Um, he serves, he serves so many selflessly, Lord, and we thank you, we thank you for him, Lord. We ask for continued prayer for, for Bill, as he is in the ICU, Lord, and as having a, a very difficult time. We pray for him, and we pray for Bonnie, as um, they're just, they're having a difficult time, and it's, and it's hard for the family, Lord. We, we pray for Cheryl and Rich, and we ask them to just lift them up and give them physical strength, Lord, so that they can help take care of their family. We thank you that Bill and Bonnie have people close to them, Lord, that love them so much, Lord. Um, we ask, Lord, prayer for Carol as she's, as she's still in the hospital, and they're trying to give the doctors wisdom, Lord, as they try to figure out what's going on with her, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you be with Pastor Bill this morning. Uh, speak through him. Remove any distractions from, from his mind, Lord, and give him your words to use him as a vessel to speak to our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts to receive your word even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us one more time. We're going to sing and prepare our hearts for the message.
It's good exercise. That's making me humble. <sighs> Morning, children. Morning. Good to see everybody. Somebody said, good morning, Pastor. It's good to see you. I said, at my age, it's good to be seen. <laughs> really? Yeah, I was listening to Matt as, as Matt was uh, sharing with you uh, some of the the uh, groups that you support. I, I couldn't help but stop and think about Rancho for Boys with Dave Bailey. Pastor Dave's gone now. He's gone home with the Lord. I, I knew Dave Bailey very well. He was a good friend and a wonderful man. And what he's done, what he had done for those kids over decades is incredible and it is well worth uh, your support and prayers and what they do for those young people because they are really, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful ministry. I get to do communion today after the message. I, I love doing communion. I really do. Uh, it's a time of remembrance. And we need to remember our Lord. We need to remember. Not just Good Friday, you know, or Sunday. But we need to remember him. Remember he said, do this often when you think of me. You know, and uh, it's a wonderful thing to, to meditate on, on what Jesus has done. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm so glad to be able to share that with you today after the, after the message. You know, I, I, as I told you, uh, a lot of the messages that I get come from questions from the, the, the guys or ladies from the Atlantic City Rescue Mission, you know, during the chapel services and things like that. And I was uh, speaking to them in a chapel service, and 
a young fellow came up to me and he said, Pastor Bill, he said, I get that Jesus is coming again. But what should I be doing when he comes? That's really a good question. What should you be doing? What should we be doing just prior or at the time when Jesus comes? You know, there's a lot of, a lot of questions that are being asked today among Christians. With the events that are happening on the, on the world stage today, um, you know, is Jesus coming to take us, to take his church, you know? When's that going to happen? You know, pre-trib, is it mid-trib, is it post-trib? In the millennium, you know, they want to know that. Pre-mill, I'm mill, I don't care if it's general mills. <laughs> I, I, I'm ready, you know, I'm, I, and I'm ready and I'm prepared. But there's questions. The evil that's upon the world, is this the time of the Antichrist? Is he living? Is he existing on earth today? When will he rise up? When, where? What are the signs of Jesus' coming? The question remains, what will or should we be doing when the Lord comes? to take his church. You know, the world's becoming more, uh, honest to goodness, all you have to do is look at the news. And um, My son and all, Jim, this morning, we're, we're talking about um, things that are happening in the world and, and uh, just the signs and the various things that are going on. And uh, the world's becoming more perverse. What was it, about six months ago I, or, or, or whatever it was? Uh, no, in fact, it was last year. I think it was last year really stuck out that the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium were going to have a day where they had these people coming in. They were called the, make sure I get it right, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. They were men dressed in nun's clothing, white-faced, and speaking about how right it is to have all kinds of sexual perversion. Fortunately, there was enough hubbub about it that they canceled it which I thought was a pretty good idea. But it's becoming more and more. I mean, you have gay parades, you have everything, things that I would have never seen as a child back in the 50s. You would have never seen anything like that. But only a matter of decades, it has changed so greatly. But the, this should strike as Christians and students of the word, this should never strike you as, oh, I'm amazed. You should know these things are coming. The Word of God has told you this. If you're a student of the Word, you should know these things. You should be prepared for these things. And for Satan's devices. Paul said, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Unfortunately, I have to, have to state how I feel on that statement. I, I think the church as a whole, across America, wherever the world, is ignorant of a lot of Satan's devices. We're not into the Word of God enough. Someone asked me one day, well, how do you, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you know something's false? How do you know that, that you know, uh, it's not real? How do you recognize it? I say, know the original. You know the Word of God, you're going to, you're going to be prepared for it. You're going to be ready for it. That's why I charge you every Sunday when I'm here, I charge you, get into that word. You need to be your life. I, th I think it was last week when I told you, uh, someone asked me about what's more important, prayer or the word of God, and I, re I repeated what Spurgeon said. What's more important, breathing in or breathing out? You need both. The world's more angry. You know, this is the truth. At the mission, I've been there a lot of years. And the young people that are coming in are angrier than I've ever seen them before. They're frustrated, hopeless. The anger against the world and their, the way their lives are going. And I see that every day. And there's nothing worse 
than looking into a pair of hopeless eyes. Not just depressed eyes. Hopeless. Where they've come to the end. Right here. There are more and more false religions vying for the souls of man, stirred by the evil one. It's a great counterfeit. Like I said, the only way to recognize a counterfeit is to know the original. So many ideologies that are vying for the thoughts of men so we can get rid of God. Man can do it on their own. You know, we got socialism and communism telling us that we, we can form our own utopia in the world, which has not worked over, worked out very good over the number of decades. Hundreds of millions of people have died because of these ideologies. Relativism, relativism is so popular today. Postmodernism, you can really get into some of this philosophical stuff. I always love these guys to get into the real philosophical. They like to drill out words that are this long. I have to tell them I don't think they know what it means. The whole purpose of it is, is really there's no God. We have no need of God. Man can take care of everything himself. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. That's relative. Basically what it is. I call it overthink. People are overthinking. And the reason why they're doing it is because they, wanted, they don't want God to exist. Listen, same way with the evolutionists. Really, when you break it down, and I've talked to many people, many of these diverse concepts and ideologies and, and uh, scientific theories. And the real problem is not a head problem. It's really a heart problem. That's really what it is. I took an astronomy class once many, many years ago, just for fun, because I love the study of the universe. And the professor was a young fella, probably in his late 30s, handsome as could be. That's why most of the class was filled with girls. I don't think they had a clue or could care less about what was being taught, just as long as Dr. Zablotny was his name, was there, because he was really a handsome fella. And so I got to talk to him a lot, you know, during the time, gave him a little problems here and there, but as gentlemanly as I could. <laughs> and finally, you know, when the course was over, I remember walking down to the parking lot with him, and we were walking down. I said, Doc, I said, look, really, what do you have against the teachings of Jesus? And the word of God, I mean, you know, in what it teaches of love. And he said, oh, he said, I don't, I don't have any problem with Jesus. Now, this is the first time I can ever remember reading or hearing an evolutionist, be absolutely honest. You know what he said to me? I remember he lived quite a different life. He said, Bill, he said, I don't have anything against Jesus. It's just that if I had to live your way, I'd have to rearrange my life a whole lot, and I'm not willing to do that. So it wasn't a mental problem. It's a heart problem. And that's what we're facing today. That's why your life must shine like a light in a very dark world. You got to live like you preach, like you talk. Like the guy said the mission, you know, you talk the talk, you're going to have to what? Got it. They'll catch it right away. The, Lord, the, the world will catch it right away. And you've got to be warm. You've got you to you have that light. See, not just a cold light. It's got to be a warm light. It's going to attract people here. You remember the story I told you a long time ago when I first came in here? I sat in that back seat. I think one person that I knew, whatever, at that point, said hello, and the rest of the people all said hello to each other and never said a word to me. And I let you know about it. My poor wife, I told her that, I'll never forget. Her face went absolutely, you didn't say that to those people, did you? I said, yeah, I did. And for your benefit, 
Many, many of you came to me and apologized for that. And you know, it's been funny ever since. I remember the next week I came back, you all came in like this, hi, Pastor Bill, hi, Pastor Bill, hi, Pastor Bill, hi, Pastor Bill. Yeah. Because you're really a warm and wonderful church. You're, you're a wonderful group of people. But people want to be wanted and, and, and want to feel like they're welcome when they come in. Now I went to a breakfast yesterday. Men's breakfast. Not one said hello to me. A couple friends that I knew. No, I didn't say anything, no. <laughs> I don't think I said anything. But how do you expect to draw the world if they don't feel the love of Jesus in you? That's why communion is so great. It gives us remembrance of what he's done. We should be the most joyous, welcoming, loving, kind, generous human beings that walk on the face of the earth. Not like a cold world that I've been speaking about with all these people vying for the world's allegiance. Again, we live in a post-Christian era. Never thought I'd see that in this country, but we do. And that's up to us, and I truly believe, you know, I'm going to be very blunt with you, the church has not done its job. We have not. I'm talking about the Church of America. We've not done our job. If we had it, we, churches would be overflowing. But we seem to be afraid to share the Word of God, be afraid or fearful in some way or embarrassed. And how embarrassed will we be when we stand before the Lord? And he said, what did you do with my son? Who shed his blood for you. Who by his wonderful grace has saved an unworthy human being like me and you. We have the greatest news in the world to share with other people. You have people in your family who aren't saved. You have friends, co-workers that aren't saved. We've got, become very complacent. We have a purpose and a goal. You know, I remember writing down one time, and it, my thoughts were, procrastination is the assassination of destination. We procrastinate, I'll, I'll do it later. Oh, I'll share this. I'll get to the word later. I'll get to prayer later. I'll get to that fellow that I know I got a witness to, or that young lady that I got to invite to church. I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. But our purpose and our destination is to bring people into Christ. That's our destiny. And that's where we're headed. Every day we're headed towards somebody that the Holy Spirit is leading us to. Cold church will never, ever be a welcoming place for those who are broken and lost. And like I told you, I see them every day. And you know, there's people just like them, but they have homes, they have jobs, they're married, they live a regular life, and yet inside, they're messed up. Because the word of God is not in them. Jesus is coming. How are you spending your time? Now, I love it when I can hear a pin drop. You're really listening. You know that? You are. I can tell that. You are good listeners. You're a great church. Jesus is coming. Matthew 24, 44 says this, Therefore, you who follow me must always be ready because the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not expect him. This isn't to a lost world. This isn't stated to a lost world. This is stated to the church. You don't know the time of the hour. You can get an idea how things are coming around. Talk about that. 
But that's the words of Jesus. Because he says the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you're not going to expect it. So you need to be ready. Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Thessalonica, very young church. But a church that was certainly willing to learn and absorb the truth of what Paul had to say. Paul says to them, Now as to the times and dates, brothers and sisters, you have no need for anything to be written to you. In other words, I've already told you these things. Literally, it should read, you should, should have no need. Do you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the return of the Lord is coming just as a thief comes unexpectedly and suddenly in the night? Are you ready? Are you doing the things that God expects you to do? And we're going to find out what they are. You know, I... Some of you have seen the Bible I use. And, you know, it's quite marked up. And I really believe that everyone should be into their word I really do. Matthew chapter 24 and, and 25 tell us a whole lot about his coming. In fact, in Matthew chapter 24, it's interesting. As he's, the disciples come to him privately on the mount, and there's plenty of other people around, but they come to him privately and say, Lord, when shall be the, what's the time you're coming back, and what are going to be the signs? And, you know, he speaks about various things, you know, earthquakes, Somebody was saying on the news the other day, everybody was, we had a 4.8 earthquake. And they were interviewing somebody from California, and they say, what do, you, what do you think about that? And he goes, oh, like big deal. <laughs> Famines, pestilence, wars and rumors of wars. Constantly. But I did notice that Jesus mentions what I call the ultimate sign of his coming. The ultimate sign, and we may be overlooking this, and he repeats it three times in that chapter. Chapter 5, uh, or excuse me, verse 5, verse 11, and verse 24. And the key word is, be not deceived. For many false Christs and false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. He says that in verse 5 and, and verse 11. And then verse 24 he says, and they shall show you, these deceivers, great signs and wonders that, if it were possible, they would deceive even the very elect you. Great signs and wonders, things in the heavens and on earth. Signs. And yet Jesus said, and yet these are the beginning." Of sorrows. So be ready. It's interesting in uh, verse, I think it's verse 32. Yeah. Jesus talks about fig tree. He's going to give you some signs here. He said, learn a lesson from the fig tree. But when you see the leaves of the tree begin to turn green, you know what? The summer's near. Even in like manner, when you begin to see all these things that I have spoken to you, know that I am near, even at the door. It's a pretty stern warning. Even at the door. Verse 42, so be alert. In other words, give strict attention. Be cautious and active in faith. That's what he's saying. For you do not know 
which day, whether near or far, your Lord is coming. You know, the word is very specific on the things that are happening, coming about. And I got to wear these to read the small print. Listen to this. Verse 45 to 51. When then, or who then, is the faithful and wise servant? Listen to the word of God. Whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, Jesus says, he will set him over all of his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of, the, of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him in an hour that he does not know. And then he'll deal with them. We're to be working. Doing the things that God expects us to do. We all think how wonderful. Oh, Jesus is coming. It's going to be a great thing and a wonderful thing. And it's also going to be a terrifying thing for some people. Because it will be the end. Listen, they won't be setting up any voting booths. When Jesus comes back, he will come back as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. There won't be a second chance. We get second chances all the time. We get third chances. A person said to me the other day, I'm so thankful to God for giving me a second chance. I didn't deserve that second chance. I said, you didn't deserve the first one. But we got it through the grace of God, didn't we? And just interesting as we move over a chapter, and there's so much in chapter 24 and 25 that you need to read. Parable of the Ten Bridesmaids. Now, I don't have all the time to go be so elaborate on one thing, but basically through this parable that Jesus is telling about being prepared, five were wise and five weren't. Five were prepared. And when the bride, we call the bridegroom, come on, come to the wedding. They were all prepared. The lamps are all set. We're going in. The others, oh, we've run out. You better go get some. And they went, but by the time they get back, the door's shut. See, they were indifferent to the word of God. There was indifference. That's a sorrowful word. Indifference. Powerable of the talents. It's interesting today how talent is used. Uh, back then it was money. Today we look at it as somebody's ability. And I think it has to do with both if you really look at it. One was given five talents, the other was given two and one, and the first two invested it and worked hard, knowing that their master would be coming back. The other one, he kind of was indifferent. Dug a little hole and buried it. The master came back and wasn't very happy, was he? You know the parable. He was thrilled that the man who had five talents invested it. See, we invest in what? People. And souls. Man had two as well. The man who had one, he said, "Well, I knew you were a taskmaster. I knew you were tough, so I, 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 I buried it." But here it is. 
He wasn't pleased with just getting that back. He expected. That master expected something back for his investment. Nobody put more of investment into humanity than Jesus. The Lord said to everyone who has and values his blessings and gifts from God and has used them wisely, more will be given to them. But what's the sin here? Sin is indifference to the things of God. Indifference. Hmm. You know, if you read chapter 25, verses 31 to 40, you really get a good idea of what's going on here. And it says this, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and he will do that, and all the angels with him, then will he sit on his glorious throne. And now listen. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Well, you know who the sheep are. That's us. The goats, that doesn't mean greatest of all time. That's the law. And he will place the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. What a wonderful thing that will be to hear those words say to you, said to you. And he says, where I was hungry. Oh, now we're getting into it. Now we're getting into it. Where I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, literally means homeless. And you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison. And you came to me. How compassionate is that? Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or, or thirsty and give you to drink? And when, would the, when did we see you a, a, a homeless person and visit you and, and bring you in? And clothe you and visited you. And you were sick and in prison. And the king will say, Jesus will say, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, it's as if you did it to me. Now most people stop there. Isn't that wonderful? You're doing all these good things, and the master comes. And blessings poured out upon you. Reminds me of the Christmas carol. I love the Christmas carol. I, I really do. I've watched that so many times I could probably recite it. Because that Dickens had some great truths there. There's one part where Marley comes back to visit, you know, his ghost comes back to visit. Scrooge, he's come back to give Scrooge some advice and procure an opportunity for him to get his life right. Scrooge tries to make Marley feel good. He said, but, but Jacob, you were a good businessman. Marley takes his chains that are bound with him, shakes them up like this, and said, mankind was my business. 
Now, if any of you were sleeping, I probably just woke you up then. Mankind was my business. Scrooge learned a lesson. Now, seems like it goes on here. Then he will say to those on the left, now we know to the left are the goats, the unbelievers, the deniers, the rejecters, the indifferent. Then he will say to those on his left, this will be, let me tell you something, listen to me, children listen to me, this will be the most horrifying words any human being, man or woman, will ever hear at that moment and through eternity. He said to them, depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You imagine the horrifying feeling. No second chance. But what does he say? Oh, he repeats what he said to the, to the sheep. But he says this, For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was, a, I was homeless, and you never welcomed me. You never took me in. You ignored me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, even. I was in prison, and you never even came to see me. How easy it is for us to forget people in their worst times of life, to ignore them, to put them aside, to be indifferent to their condition. Yet God has not forsaken them. And neither should you. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, homeless, naked, sick, in prison? And did not minister to you. Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these, these, will go away into eternal punishment. The righteous. Into eternal life. That's some hard reading. That's some hard reading. Sins of indifference and omission. James tells us in chapter 2, verses 15 and 17, he says this, if a brother, and, and listen to the word of God, children, listen to it. If a brother or sister be naked and in lack of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Go in peace. Be you warmed and, and filled. James says, And yet you give them not the things needed for their body? What does it profit? See, that's a sin of indifference. Towards those people. Now notice, just notice, the charge against the lost ones, the goats, really didn't concern any kind of um, obvious moral violation, but their indifference sealed their end. throughout this entire chapter. The point has been emphasized. Listen, you know what it is? And I put this down in my notes because it struck me this way. The price of indifference is too high to pay. And that was a lesson learned by Scrooge before it was too late. Men come and say, uh, uh, am, I, um, am I to meet Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? 
Mr. Marley's been dead for these seven years. So then we would suppose that his benefactor would be generous enough to feed those people who are, who are destitute and poor. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Oh, I'm sure there's plenty of those, sir. Good. Then they should go there. If they are to die, then let them do it and reduce the surplus population. Whoa! Is that hard or what? But what is it? It's indifference. Too bad for them. Children, we cannot afford to be indifferent towards Jesus and his return. We cannot afford to be indifferent toward the Holy Spirit who makes us ready for Jesus' return, for his guiding and his leading us. We cannot afford to be indifferent with the resources that God gives us the giving. That's a wallet. Don't you hate it when a preacher, you know, I, I hear it all the time, you know, preacher, oh, we're going to talk about giving now and tithing. My preacher talks about it all the time. Why should he have to? You can't outgive God. Give and it shall be given unto you. Do you ever read it? How should you give? Pack down the full measure. The overflowing. It always reminds me when I was a kid. You know, you go into the, the, the mom and pop store. I remember, still remember when I was a little boy. And you go get an ice cream cone. And see, what they did was they didn't just plop it on top like they do today. They put the ice cream in there and push it in. You know, they push it in. And then they plop another one on. And then they plop another one, and they push it down. And when they push it down, you got all those little edges around there. That's what you got first. See, it was full measure, pressed down to overflowing. And with a generous, joyous heart, a hilarious giver. That's what it literally means. <laughs> Here's my wallet. Go ahead and take it. I don't care. It's all yours, Lord. <laughs> The tougher the times, the more you need to give. What did Jesus say to the, to the churches in the Revelation? I see your works. I see. I walk among the candlesticks, the churches. I see what you do. And he says something else. He's really saying something that I know why you do what you do. Do you do it for your own glory or for his? Indifference. Some of you are very gifted with your hands, your abilities, tech, all this, and you give it. So your technician back there, and that's why I sound so good. Actually, my voice is six octaves higher. You just think it is, but he's lowered it. No, I'm only kidding. But that's a gift. You all have wonderful gifts and abilities, let alone spiritual gifts. Are you using them? The musicians that are up here, they're given their talents, their abilities that God's given them. We cannot afford to be indifferent to the needy people of the world all around us. Not just the homeless, but family, friends, neighbors, co-workers. You gotta be the light that shines. I want what he has. I want what she has. I want that peace that she has. I want that confidence that he has. Where are you getting that? We cannot afford to be indifferent to the lost humanity that will stand in judgment. And we just read it. 
You know, if it were possible, and I don't think it is, but just let's presume that those two groups are together and all of a sudden one of the goats says and looks over and sees you over on the, on the right side and says, Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you share it with me? I don't think that's going to happen. But what if it did? There's still a truth there. Everyone needs to examine themselves. We're going to do that in a minute. Matthew 24, 44, therefore be ready. Simple, as plain as that. In the 46th verse, blessed is that faithful servant when their master returns and finds them, literally means, it says working, but literally it means serving another. This is the answer to that young man's question. That chapter explains it. And again, I leave you with this. I, Revelation 2.2, 2, I know your works. Jesus is walking. The Spirit of Christ is walking. Is among his people. He sees. He hears. Remember it said Jesus knew all hearts. He knows your motives. Why you do what you do. The answer to that young man's question and to ours. Now you may not think that that's the most profound message you could hear. Probably isn't. That's an important one you need to hear. In a minute, we're going to take communion. I love doing communion. Now, you would think some pastors get all nervous and say, oh, I'm in another church. I, I, I don't know how. It's communion. Fellowship. With us and the Lord and its remembrance. Now, I'm going to pray in a minute and I'll ask the elders to come up, get ready to come up and, and to serve you. And I'm going to read some things to you. I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes. We're going to hear Apostle Paul speak to us in his remembrance of what he was taught about the Last Supper. So let me, let me just close in prayer for this part, and then the men, men you can come up. and uh... Father God, again, we thank you for your word. There's nothing like your word. It's just that you speak to us so clearly and so poignantly and, and so dramatically and so powerfully and, and so truthfully. And I just pray for these dear children of yours, and I know they love you, that like any of us, we all have our ups, our downs, we all have our inconsistencies, but I pray, Father, that you would remove any of the indifferences that we have in us towards a lost world, because it instantly reminds me, Father, of how you weren't indifferent to me and to my brothers and sisters here. You gave your only begotten, the unique one, the one of a kind, out of grace and love that we could barely understand. Suffer on a cross so brutally. And even worse than that, to bear the penalty of all the sinful people in the world. Father, I don't get it. I don't fully get it. I don't think I'll ever fully understand the compassion, the love, and the grace that you've shown us, but I am so grateful for it. And now, Father, as we celebrate, as you've commanded our, our wonderful ability to commune with you and remember you, Bless us as we do it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, gentlemen. Terry. <laughs> you know, guys, um, as the men pass out these the elements, the disciples, the apostles, recorded this last night. It was a solemn night, but it was a joyous night. Who could have known what's going through the mind of Jesus, the man, at this time? You ever try to meditate in between the lines and think how Jesus was preparing himself? Knowing his destiny, we, we spoke about this last week, that he knew, he predicted his death, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. He told them this was going to happen. It's the greatest event in the history of the world. Oh, his first coming fulfilled the prophecies, and we celebrate it on Christmas, and it's wonderful. But this is where he says, it is finished. It is finished. All the prophets from the beginning to the time of Christ's resurrection, all of it had predicted that this is exactly what would happen. This is what makes the Bible so unique. Again, as we spoke last week and the week before, the Bible is, 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 is beyond anything, any other written literature that has ever been produced on the face of the earth. There's no other religion that compares to this. They're all duplicates and, and things that have not been uh, true and imitated by, by Satan. Okay, gentlemen. So what's involved here? What's involved here is bread. And what is involved here, thank you. That bread represents, of course, the body of Christ. And it also represents the bloodshed. You know, I've, I've, I've been in communions where I've watched a pastor or, or anyone or elders or whatever, and they give out the elements, boom, 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 like that, and without ever first, as Paul has instructed, before you take any of these elements that represent the body that suffered on the cross for Christ and the blood that was shed, we need to bring a confession before the Lord. We need to make our hearts right. I've watched over and over, but they forget to do that. Or if you're unworthy, to, sometimes a child doesn't, should be sitting next to you receiving the communion when they know nothing of it. It's your duty to explain to them what it is. <clears throat> and I want to take just a moment to have a silent moment in your hearts and mine to bring confession of anything that's in here whether it's by commission or omission, that we need to bring before the Lord so that we have and we are worthy to be able to take these elements. So let's take a moment in prayer. Just go before the Lord and let him know what's really in there and give that back to him. Let's pray. Lord God, there are so many things 
to get in our way. I pr- I grateful to the brother as he as he prayed for me this morning to remove any kind of obstacles that would be in the way, anything that would hinder me from bringing the word and and meaning it in my life. And I I deeply appreciated that prayer. There are always obstacles, Father, in our way. And right now, we want to remove those and come to you. And as some of the brothers and sisters have already come to you in, in prayer and humility, to lay before you their sins, their negligence, various things that have kept us from, from you and have maybe perhaps hindered your work within us. And, and Father, we just bring them before your throne right even now, confessing and knowing that they are laid at Jesus' feet, and through his grace they are forgiven. And you make us pure and holy, and I thank you. In Jesus' name for that. Amen. In the letter that Paul wrote to, to the Corinthians, the first letter, chapter 11, he says this. Remember, Paul was... Born again, in late time, he said, I was, I was, you know, he was saved on the road to Damascus. An enemy of God, persecuting the Christians. And yet he can say to the Corinthians, for I received from the Lord. But I also deliver to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. It's a symbol. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. And the literal term here in the Greek is, which is physically broken for you. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. Good Friday gave us the very evidence of what here Paul's speaking of, when Jesus' body was brutally beaten, brutally torn apart. Many of you saw the movie numbers of years ago, The Passion. I could only see that once. I have no desire to see that movie again. Not because it wasn't a good movie, not because it didn't tell the truth, but it was so devastating to me to look at his body For my sins, his body was broken, crucified. Agony which you and I will never understand. Then, the deepest spiritual separation, if it's possible to even conceive it, when the Father, when it became dark and the Father turned his back from sin. And he that was without sin became sin for us. Can you imagine? His broken, weary body, pulling up to breathe and feeling the agony in his feet and his back and his arms. Horrible death. And when he said, take this, this is my body, it represents the body. I'm not getting into theological aspects now between the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches and all that. That can be some other time we can deal with that, but what I'm telling you is that it represents the body as Jesus broke it. Bread was broken and handed to each. He said, do this. Do this in remembrance. That means to keep it in your mind of what he had gone through for you. And that's physically. Take and eat. Paul says in the same way also he took the cup after supper. Saying this, listen to what he says now. This is What he meant when he cried out, it is finished. This cup is the new covenant, the new testament, the new agreement between God and man now. 
They would no longer be trying to follow the works of the law because we couldn't do it anyway. The law is a wonderful thing. It shows us the truth of God, but we can never fulfill it. None of us. Actually, it was a condemner. Paul says it was a school teacher to show us how deep in sin we really are. Who could take that away? The greatest of prophets could not take it away. John the Baptist couldn't take it away. The angels couldn't take it away. I'll tell you who could take it away. John the Baptist told you. And he turned all the people around as he was baptized and he said, Behold, look. The Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. God was bringing his own lamb, perfect lamb, but the one who was presenting it now was not a sinful man, but the holy God bringing his own lamb. Satan had no claim on him. A new covenant by the grace of God. An unmerited work of God to us. Something we didn't deserve. We don't. And yet it's given his most lovely of gifts. New covenant. But it could only be done, Jesus said, and Paul recognizes this, in my blood, Jesus said. It must be done by the perfect blood of the Lamb. Do this. Now listen. Paul's quoting Jesus. Do this as often as you drink it, again, in remembrance of of me. It took the very blood of the man God. God man, Jesus. The very blood, the life sustaining force in the human body, it took his blood that would be poured out for you and I. This is grace. Take and drink it. Our Heavenly Father, help us to remember. Truly help us to remember. What depth you went to redeem your people. How glorious, how wonderful, how precious is the love. And we, Father, help each one of your children here to remember this and to also remember that this is a gateway. This new covenant is a gateway to eternity. For there is no more sorrow and pain and suffering. For you had promised that you would wipe away every tear from every eye. Be no more sorrow, no more death. We would never know the loss of a loved one again. Never know the power of sin that grips us. And to live eternity in a perfect creation whole universe will be open to us. Untold adventures and abilities, time with you and others, saints that have long passed we'll know as brothers and sisters even better than that. A place where there will be peace, love, and wonders never ceasing. But it all started with what you did. And we thank you for this new agreement, this new covenant, this new testament of your love towards us, not by works, for it is grace that we are saved through faith. But not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, you, lest any of us should boast. Now bless each and every one here. We close in our praise to you.
hear our praise and our thanksgiving. And again, bring remembrance to us of the wonderful things that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join us for our final song. Thank you. 